and a very warm welcome to this webinar. I'm Arpita Bedekar. I am the head of marketing at Fintlect, a research training and advisory services company focused on AML and CFT across Asia. At the outset, many thanks for joining us today. This is the first in a series of four webinars that we are proud to present along with the Asian Bankers Association. The topic for today is the role of AML compliance in correspondent banking. If you are a banker based in Asia or indeed anywhere else in the world, the objective of this session is to provide you with some more knowledge on the inherent AML risks within a correspondent banking framework to provide guidance on the Wolfsburg CBDDQ and some do's and don'ts around it. We will be going through some case studies and of course we are happy to take questions towards the end. I'll begin straight away by introducing the first speaker for this session, Shirish Pathak, the founder and managing director of Fintlect Advisory Services. Shirish has been instrumental in navigating Fintlect through an organic growth path across India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vietnam and the Philippines and continues to in actively invest time, energy and capital in building awareness about anti-money laundering within the banking and financial services industry across the region. I now request Shirish to take over and to kickstart the discussions for today. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon to those of you in forward time zones in Asia. Welcome to this Fintelect and Asian Bankers Association webinar on anti-money laundering in correspondent banking. My name is Shirish Patak. I represent Fintelect, and I'm delighted to be here today with you to engage in conversation with our expert guests and, of course, with all of you. Let me first outline the structure that we will follow for today's webinar. For the first 30 minutes, I will ask a few questions on the subject to our guest expert, Mr. Charan Rawat, Head of Compliance at Rubber Bank, followed by a 15-minute case study. And at the end, we will keep 15 minutes to answer participant questions. During the webinar, please feel free to post questions in the text box in your GoToWebinar screen. We will try and address as many of them as possible uh, during the Q&A session. So according to recently published statistics, while the number of banks globally has increased, the number of correspondent banking relationships has gone down. As per research published by the World Bank in a recent survey of 300 banks across 92 countries, 27% have reported a decline in correspondent relationships, and 72% banks have reported that they face multiple challenges with correspondent banking relationship viability and compliance costs being two of the significant ones. One of the critical factors for a growing economy is international trade, and correspondent banking is the lifeblood of this global commerce as it facilitates connectivity among financial systems. However, due to the trend of global financial institutions increasingly terminating or restricting business relationships with local banks and remittance companies in certain regions around the world, there could be serious implications. There is a real threat to economic stability and growth as it can adversely affect both trade and remittances. And this is particularly a concern for the developing nations as they are the hardest hit by this reduction in correspondent banking relationships. As I said, our guest speaker here today is Charan Rawat, Head of Compliance uh, at Rubber Bank. Uh, before uh, I ask him a few questions, let me just uh, give you a brief about him. So Charan has over 32 years of experience in banking with large international banks such as Barclays, Standard Chartered, ANZ, Greenlays Bank. Uh, he started his career with uh, State Bank of India where he worked for a couple of years uh, and another stint at Vijaya Bank. Uh, where he oversaw and managed corporate credit relationships with some of the largest industrial names. Uh, he has, during his uh, long and illustrious career, worked across retail, corporate and investment banking, wealth management in multiple functions, and he has the unique distinction of also having worked on the compliance side. So, uh, without further ado, let me uh, get on to asking Charan uh, for his thoughts uh, on this subject. So, Charan, as a starting point for this webinar and to set the scene, can you outline some of the key points of the FATF recommendations related to monitoring and risk management of correspondent banking relationships as per the 2016 direction? Uh, thank you, Shirish, and good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, as the timelines may be. Uh, at the outset, let me, let me say thanks that it's a wonderful initiative you have for the webinar. And the idea is that different people interact. Coming back to the question that you really raised, 
uh, first and foremost, we really got to see to what the correspondent banking is. And FATF over the years has been making recommendations about reducing the financial crime risk in banking system. The most recent guidelines that they have come out with, uh, they need to be seen in context of the original 40 recommendations. And the three of them that I would really like to draw attention on is uh, the recommendation number 10, 13 and 16. Uh, which coming to the specifics and without getting into the jargons, it talks about knowing your customer. It knows about recording, uh, keeping the records of the customer and transaction. And third is the transaction monitoring. Correspondent banking relationship, as we all know, and as all listeners uh, for this webinar would know, is provision of banking services by one bank to another bank. So in that sense, the end user for the bank or the customer is not really known to the bank which is providing the services. And an intermediary bank is using services of another institution to deliver goods to goods and services for its end consumer. So as you said rightly in the beginning, international banks are trying to de-risk their businesses because of perceived risks involved in money remittances, particularly in case of funds transfer across the globe. And that's where knowing the institution becomes very, very critical. Uh, there's been a lot of debate happening around, do you know your customer? And are you also supposed to know customers, customer, what we call as KYCC? In a domestic business, it's very, very important that you need to know. But in an international business, it will be asking for too much that a correspondent bank would really know the entire background of a customer of its respondent bank. And recognizing this, FATF in its own recommendations has mentioned that KYCC in a correspondent banking scenario does not mean that the correspondent bank has to do a full fledged due diligence on the end consumer or end customer. So uh, this is, I think, is a starting point. I don't know whether I've addressed your question adequately, Shirish. Sure. So uh, let me move on to the next question. Um, you know, what do you see as some of the inherent AML risks that banks should uh, uh, factor in while managing their correspondent banking relationships? What is it that they have to be definitely aware about? The, the very nature uh, of correspondent banking makes it a risky business because you don't know who your customer is in the sense that who's moving the funds. The correspondent bank relies primarily on the certification and assessment of the respondent bank. And that's where an assessment of the respondent bank becomes very, very critical. But you are primarily relying on the declarations and certifications. What is flowing through the accounts of the customer? What is the nature of the transactions? Whether the respondent bank has done a full fledged due diligence how effective are its transaction monitoring systems? How effective is the training? What kind of a geographical risk? What kind of a product risk that the respondent bank is running is something that may not be known directly to the correspondent bank. And each of these risk points or matrix, if I might use that word, makes correspondent banking business that much more riskier and difficult to deliver. Now, uh, just just take an example. There are certain geographies globally which are uh, uh, highly risk prone in terms of drug long, uh, drug bill transactions. And money launderers globally try to make and abuse the banking system in some shape or form. Now, if one were to receive a request for correspondent banking relationship from a institution and without sounding disrespectful for any local or an international institution. But let's say if a bank were to come from Colombian border or if it would come from the Golden Crescent in Asia or a Golden Triangle of Indonesia, uh, I'm say of uh, Thailand, Burma, you would expect that the risk of drug money going through banking system is further enhanced compared to, let's say, a typical financial transaction that would happen through a bank in New York or London or Mumbai for that matter. Hmm. So that's 
if we are talking about the geographical risk. Again, the similar example that one can think of is what kind of products and services you are rendering. Uh, private banking business globally has been seen to be a high risk prone business. And if a correspondent bank is involved in clearing funds for private bank customers or high net worth individuals, in some of those jurisdictions, those people could be connected with PEP risk. And that enhances risk for the correspondent bank. Now, to what extent is the correspondent bank aware of the nature of customers or how much detail is the respondent bank is willing to share also enhances the element of risk. The FATF guidelines expect to, the correspondent bank to raise a request for information. And if the information provided is sufficient, or if somebody wants to abuse the system, if it's camouflaged, the correspondent bank has got no capability to challenge or revalidate that information, except what is available in the public domain. So I, I see this lack of awareness of the customer of the direct customer is the biggest risk that that the correspondent banks run and that's where the transaction monitoring systems even at the correspondent bank becomes extremely useful as to how efficient the systems are in tracking where the funds are originating from which kind of jurisdictions are the funds going to what is the pace what is the velocity of these funds coming are the same names appearing time and again for handling those funds and this can raise this can raise suspicions. This can become a ground for inquiring further, and if need be, close the relationship. So, yeah, that, that's how I look at the the risks associated with the correspondent banking. Right. So, Charan, uh, although uh, you mentioned that FATF uh, mandates otherwise, uh, many banks are still under the impression that terms such as KYCC means that they have to undertake due diligence on their correspondent bank's customer. So can you outline some of the CDD uh, or ADD requirements in the correspondent banking relationships and the actual boundaries uh, that should be maintained? That takes us into a, a, a different domain of the Volkswagen principles, new guidelines which have come upon or the correspondent banking uh, DDQ questionnaire. And I would like to answer this particular question referring to the Wolfsburg principles of Wolfsburg questionnaire. If you look at that questionnaire, the entire theme is, or rather the questionnaire has been split up into 13 different themes, which starts from knowing your customer as in who the bank is. It starts from looking at their policies, their practices, their transaction monitoring systems. It talks about what kind of training modules that they have, what kind of a transaction monitoring system they have, what kind of a regulatory regime that prevails in monitoring. So, for example, how effective is their FIU counterpart, if I were to give an example, and what kind of disciplinary actions have been initiated. And this will all form a part of our uh, uh, CDD exercise so far as the respondent bank is concerned. With the 2018 deadline past us, I think all banks globally would now be using, hopefully using the same CBDD Q template issued by Wolfsburg uh, Group. And that is the starting point besides the normal controls that banks have in place. I would like to highlight that while the Wolfsburg principles of Wolfsburg group has issued that questionnaire and coming from the largest correspondent banking provider group, this will become de facto standard for every other bank in the globe to follow. But group has wisely communicated that decision will rest with each and every single correspondent bank. So this questionnaire has been blessed by the US and UK regulators, yet the final decision whether you want to add a few more questions, reduce a few more uh, few questions, you want to call for further details, would depend on the correspondent bank. And that really is the crux of doing a CDD, EDD on any institution. Okay. So, um, you know, you spoke about the Wolfsburg questionnaire uh, and, you know, after it was issued in June 2018, it has arguably, arguably uh, created mixed uh, feelings in many countries within Asia. 
you know about its app applicability okay and uh, also the stringent nature of the questionnaire uh, has created a few issues and many banks feel that uh, they are unable to answer some of the questions uh, effectively so while uh, the questionnaire is uh, relevant and important what is your advice to bankers uh, on this subject as to you know when they are answering this questionnaire what are the things they have to keep in mind i think interestingly this questionnaire shiresh uh, as you notice is pure binary a large part of the questionnaire is pure binary it's a yes and a no answer secondly the group itself in its uh, guidance note has said there is no right or a wrong answer what this questionnaire is doing is capturing the true information that prevails basis which the correspondent bank will decide to onboard a bank or continue the relationship or ask for further details and informations the information that uh, this questionnaire seems to gather is primarily an exercise in identifying and doing a risk based approach in managing the relationships my advice to any bank whether it's coming in from united states or whether it's going from asian continent or african continent this is a standard template this is the global standard now for all banks to follow and uh, please do not try to be economical with truth when completing this questionnaire it may not sound nice when i use that word but the fact is that any inadvertent slip up or not providing full information can jeopardize the relationships in future and this is going to affect the customers something that you referred right in the beginning that for emerging economies the trade and the cross border remittances the personal remittances are a key part of their forex exchange management and if the relationship the correspondent relationships are broken down this is going to have a severe impact a uh, few recollect again a couple of years back when the money remittance business to africa was blocked and there was a fair amount of resistance in uk and european continent because the de-risking doesn't mean you stop doing business de-risking means you identify the risk and take necessary steps to prevent the slip ups taking place and this questionnaire actually fulfills that if i were to just look at the questionnaire and do do give me some time to elaborate on this the entire questionnaire has been can be broken down into 13 themes and if i can read them out it asks for the entity ownership which we would do for any other customer if whether you are opening an account for an individual or a company so it should not be known not difficult products and services that's really asking what kind of products and services that a bank offers and why is this important the correspondent bank will really decide depending on the nature of products that you are handling what is the inherent risk are you substantially handling into cash are you substantially dealing a trade finance business then what countries uh, your funds flow really happen that can determine what is your sanctions and the aml program how good are your anti bribery and corruption programs uh, before i just progress i just like to connect to an answer why the anti bribery program is coming in here this questionnaire has sort of become a combined tool both for kyc and the financial crime risk associated with it so it's one single document instead of filling up two separate questionnaires though there is an fccq as well but if this form is filled up essentially all the fccq related queries are also answered at the same time and then this you know, the next thing that we talk about is the policies and procedures what is a kyc cdd edd procedures that prevail in the respondent bank what kind of a monitoring and reporting procedures they have now monitoring and reporting is both transaction monitoring as also your suspicious transaction report escalation so that takes us into the area of the domestic regulatory oversight that prevails on the money laundering related or aml related aspects how good is your uh, sanctions monitoring that comes into play but most important aspect i would say that any correspondent bank or if i were the person approving onboarding of a customer i would really like to say how focused is an institution on training and education because ultimately if, if you don't have well trained staff into these areas the risk of any 
unwanted transaction going through your systems is far higher. And then comes the usual thing about the compliance testing, quality assurance, and audit. So looking at totality, this questionnaire covers the entire spectrum of what an institution should be doing when it's onboarding a client or and how its life cycle should be monitored. Uh, I don't know whether that's a short enough answer or it's a long theoretical aspect, but the crux of the matter is this is a purely binary questionnaire. It does allow you to provide free text answers, but that's more to elaborate and the correspondent bank can ask you even where the answers are binary, yes or no, as to why the answer is yes or why an answer is no. So try to be as clear about your answers. Try to be as factual. And if you are not doing something, don't try to concoct a theory that we are in process of doing it and it will be implemented by early 2020. Right. All right. What excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, so, you know, as they say, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think in the case of webinars, maybe a case study is worth a thousand words. So uh, I thought, uh, you know, you could briefly take the audience uh, through what are the various risks that, uh, uh, you know, correspondent banking poses uh, in the form of a case study. So uh, it would be great if you can outline the case study now. Uh, before I start on talking about some of the well-known cases, I'm sure uh, friends on, on, on the net would know that. I'll just connect these cases to the question that you asked as to how the bank should answer the questionnaire. Well, if you don't want to answer the questionnaire truthfully and honestly, you could find yourself as one of the case studies next time around. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, so some of the cases that I'm talking about uh, uh, they are in public domain, so there's nothing confidential about it. I, I would otherwise not be able to speak of them. So penalties on correspondent banking businesses have been imposed on banks for a fairly long time. This is not new. And unfortunately, uh, these penalties have spanned across different types of banks. The small originating banks to the largest correspondent banks in the world. That's a reality, and that's why the increasing focus on how do we improve the system to minimize these risks. So let's just look at uh, the, one of the big cases that I uh, came across was a US based bank all the way back in, 19, in 2012 paid about $2 billion as penalties and it was moving the Mexican drug money. Now, obviously we all know that in a, in a money laundering transaction, there's a layering, there's a smurfing, there's a fronting, but ultimately it has to move through the banking system. And if a bank could not keep a track of where the money was coming in from, how the flows were happening, this is exactly what a bank got penalized for. Uh, 2012 was again followed by a large penalty in 2015, and this time across Atlantic from, a Germ from Germany, a very large reputed German bank was pleaded guilty for violating the sanctions uh, related to Iran, uh, Myanmar, and Sudan, and paid about $1.45 billion. Now, some of these sanction-busting cases which got investigated, yes, in the case of few banks, there were deliberate in-house uh, breaches of policies and procedures. But in quite a few cases, these were inadvertent oversights. The transactions were camouflaged, transactions were hidden without the bank knowing that these transactions are related to these countries. Uh, nearer the date, we all know the case of the French bank that paid 9 billion US dollars for OFAC sanction bursting. And uh, recently the investigations are going on for another UK based bank with very large operations in Asia and Africa and the penalty is expected to be about $1.5 billion. Now, these are just, just four cases that I've spoken of, and I'm sure Google will provide us enough and more data on number of banks that have paid penalties for the cross-border correspondent banking issues. One of the things that I would also like to highlight, though I don't have the data readily available, but correspondent banking also happens domestically. And we quite often tend to overlook what risk that runs in the domestic correspondent banking. Uh, 
So look at the typical cash management business that happens for the banks. You would be doing the transactions. The collecting banker would, rely, would usually presume it's a money relating to another bank. So their transaction systems may not be uh, focusing on those specific transactions. And for the receiving bank, these monies would generally appear as a uh, interbank transfer. And the system might miss it out exactly what it related to. So this is possibly one of the things that I would like to highlight as part of the case studies. But one of the real big ones that we really need to see, the, the most interesting one, if some of the friends have come to know, is the Russian laundromat. So this uh, is, a, is a very interesting transaction. Uh, uh, that's how it started, Shirish. This primarily started as any other cross-border loan between two companies in two jurisdictions. But where our Russian friends, or money launderers rather, uh, took advantage of the legal system was they created a dummy company which was supposed to stand as a guarantor for the loan repayment. And they got a judge in a Moldavian county to pass a decree that in the event of uh, that the loan has been defaulted and guarantor is supposed to make the payment. Now these were fictitious loans, fictitious guarantors, but backed by a true judicial decree. Using that decree, these money launderers moved to their banks and moved the money out from Russia to the the free uh, economies. Uh, if you go through the whole structure, this would put any uh, any expert lawyer and a banker to shame as to how easily the banking system could be uh, could be undermined to move such large amounts of money across borders. And had it not been for a whistleblower from within the system in Moldavia, this might have continued for a much longer time. Right. So, uh, how many jurisdictions were really involved in this case? I would ask you to guess a number. Maybe a hundred? Well, you're close. Okay. You're really close. So, if you look at the statistics, there were about 5,150 companies involved. There were 732 banks. And we'll go through that list as we go down and 96 countries. So half the world was involved in moving the money around. And that really brings to the same challenge that we talk about correspondent banking. That if money could move through 96 countries, which means it was moving through as about and 700 odd banks, just about everybody missed the flow and the color of the money there. Now you just spoke about, uh, we spoke about the countries and it, it really is sad to see that just about every country across different continents got taken in. So be it China, be it Hong Kong, be it Singapore, be it Switzerland, be it Germany. Uh, this information is available in the public domain. And, and I would really request everyone, uh, if they have time and inclination, they must go through this report at OCCRP site. Right. So I'm sure since there were so many countries involved, there would also be a very large uh, number of banks. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about the extent of involvement of each of the banks uh, in this operation? Maybe some of our listeners are from those banks. So yes, as I said, there were about 96 uh, countries and uh, there are about 700 odd banks, but there were large names as well involved into the transaction. and. Uh, So, of course, the, the large amount of money, close to about three billion moved through a, a small Moldavian bank, but it would have moved through some other bank in some shape and form. But if I were to talk of some of the bigger names here, uh, or rather familiar names, we have Danske Bank of Denmark, we have Bank of China, we have HSBC, we have Emirates NBD from UAE, we have UBS AG, uh, Bank of Communication, again from China, you have uh, Credit Suisse, you have Citibank, you have Deutsche Bank. And the reason that I'm highlighting these bigger names is not that uh, anybody did it knowingly or deliberately, but these are some of the largest correspondent banks in the world. 
and the rest that these banks are carrying as part of the correspondent banking is far higher. And this is just one small example. $20 billion collectively is possibly not even chicken feed for the kind of monies that these institutions move. But the, this case actually highlights how easy it is to, to move the dirty money through banking system. Right. So, uh, you know, looking at this chart, uh, if I see you have the big ones, uh, uh, you know, uh, which are like leaders in uh, the AMS space, and you have some very small banks as well. So, so for example, if you look at maybe Cyprus Popular Bank, that's uh, yes. one of the smaller banks. Uh, so, nobody really is immune from this, uh, from these AMS risks when it comes to correspondent banking. So, what would you say are the key learnings uh, that people should take away from this particular case? The reason that I'm talking about these geographies and, and the banks is that it's very easy for the criminals to create shell companies, to create fictitious trade transactions, move the monies around. If just about $20 billion could be routed through 900 banks, you can imagine how complex the transaction would have been for Danske Bank Estonian operations, which laundered over $200 billion over the years. Now, idea is not to scare people that uh, these kind of monies move through and banks can get caught into the money laundering traps. I'm just trying to highlight this is a real problem. And unless our procedures are in place, unless people are able to identify what kind of transactions uh, fall into this category is going to be extremely difficult to, to locate those challenges. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so, so to some of the case study, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the three things that uh, I forgot to add there, Shiri, the three things that really emerge out of these cases, it boils down to ineffective inadequate customer due diligence program both either at the end of the final bank or the respondent bank that who are you onboarding as your customer nobody understood and in turn it came to an ineffective aml program both at the respondent bank and the correspondent bank the third and the most important aspect of any uh, aml monitoring uh, plan uh, you would appreciate is the transaction monitoring systems so I give you the example of the Danske Bank transaction and their report is in the public domain. And I would urge everyone to read that report. It's an extremely uh, shocking report that funds as large as $200 billion were sloshing around the system and the transaction monitoring systems could not capture that. Another interesting thing that came out was the IT systems of uh, uh, Estonia branch were not synced with the global system. Now that's another aspect that generally tends to get overlooked. Are the banking platforms interconnected, integrated to capture all the flows that are happening? Now that not necessarily a compliance responsibility to see whether IT systems are not, but should things go wrong, that in itself becomes a parameter on which regulators are not going to take it very lightly because you're, you're not capable of monitoring transactions in your system. Mm -hmm. I think we need to recognize that banking is one integrated business. Unfortunately, over the years, as the, the volume sizes have grown up, technology has come up and specialization has come up, we tend to work in silos. Now, for example, somebody handling remittances they would look at purely from a swift code perspective, purely operational aspects. And unless there is something so glaringly obvious, person may not have any idea that this could be a, a suspicious transaction. Whereas somebody who's handling loans or customers has got no visibility of what's happening into the remittance function. Now, maybe I'm talking about it because I started my banking 32 years back in a manual era and a branch manager or an officer was supposed to know everything that was happening in the in the bank. That's no longer possible. But what I'm really trying to highlight is that banks and staff involved need to think of the transaction as a whole 
don't look at it as a pure checklist that you need to process or a TAT based transaction that you need to complete every single day. Right. Great. Uh, thanks, Charan, for sharing uh, those cases. So we are uh, slightly ahead of time, and that's a good thing because it leaves us uh, more time for questions. So, uh, Charan, I would now request you to answer some of the questions uh, that have been posed uh, by our participants. Uh, let me start with the first one. So, Charan, let me ask you the first question. Um, how do we take care of uh, shell companies uh, using uh, correspondent banks is what one of the participants has asked. Yeah, Shirish, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. And right. I would say also one of the big challenges, as the Panama Papers case has shown, large hmm. amounts of funds were being moved around through the use of shell companies. And right. again, I'll, I'll take the uh, shelter or defense, if you may, or out of right. what FATF guidelines have said about KYCC. Right. If I'm a correspondent bank, I essentially rely on the assessment, certification, and due diligence process of the respondent bank. And thus the onus essentially shifts to the bank who is moving the monies for the end consumer. And at times it will be very difficult to point out whether a shell company a so-called shell company is it's a it's a bona fide business or otherwise so a large number of businesses for example are conducted through the use of special purpose vehicles now till such time the project starts kicking in it's almost a dormant entity or created just overnight to execute a project would i call it a, what would i call it a shell company i would not because it is a bona fide business going on right. but if i just have a, a company lying on a shelf for years together all of a sudden it starts showing the funds movement and then that, that is obviously a red flag for any any bank to identify why a small company or an or a almost a dormant company is moving large amounts of funds and there the owners really relies on the originating bank and not the correspondent bank so from a correspondent bank's perspective i would say that we have a uh, the guidance available for the KYCC that if I'm satisfied with the quality and control processes of a respondent bank, our primarily responsibility ends there. All right. So, uh, you know, the next question that we've got is uh, how does a bank perform transaction monitoring for RMA relationship with a financial institution? Do the compliance officers need to review those swift messages? Well, again, uh, purely from from an RMA, the relationships don't really create a correspondent banking relationship. That again is one of the uh, the guidance that has come through. Now, what are these swift messages that are going through? And that's where the knowledge and awareness of the operating staff comes in. Even if the transaction is not being picked up part of a transaction monitoring system or a message is not picked up. But is there a wrong messaging code being used under Swift, for example? Now that could become a, co a cause for you to, to raise a query. And in that case, escalate the matter to compliance or your financial crime team. Now, for some of these cases, you cannot have a clear uh, uh, checklist or a clear answer all the time depending on on the circumstances and cases that the messages are reflecting right. and that that discretion uh, or decision will have to be taken by the relevant bankers yeah all right thanks uh, so charan uh, someone has asked uh, it was mentioned that banks uh, do not need to conduct full fledged due diligence of kycc uh, yeah. but what aspects uh, should be covered in terms of kycc I think it's the transaction monitoring and uh, I think we are raising the same subject again and possibly yeah. my answers are going to be repetitive <laughs> on the same <laughs> issue, Shirish. Right. But it's the transaction monitoring should shall be your first aspect as to what is happening. If, for example, you find a same name uh, moving large amounts of funds, right. as a correspondent bank, I'm well within my rights to make queries to the respondent bank to give me full details. Right. Of who this company is. If uh, 
if some of the participants may recall and i'm slightly digressing getting into the card payment systems mm -hmm. when the indian railways site irctc mm -hmm. had started booking railway tickets and india is a large country of about 1.3 billion people there was a massive amount of transactions happening on irctc website right and visa monitoring all of a sudden found how come a government of india site was handling large amount of commercial transactions they had actually mm -hmm. blocked that site for two days pending right. clarifications now this example will highlight the importance of transaction monitoring that are the transactions for a particular geography or a particular name or a particular type of a business appearing bona fide or reasonable and if they are not a correspondent bank is well within its rights to make queries to not process the transaction to freeze the transaction and report to its relevant fius right so so primary responsibility for client due diligence rests on the respondent bank correspondent bank's responsibility and onus is from monitoring the quality of transactions and seeking clarifications right okay so the next question uh, charan is uh, is the mt104 form uh, method for money laundering ah uh, well that's getting into two technical aspects of swift girish <laughs> and right. possibly I'll, i'll request my friends from operations to get details and maybe we can we can revert back and then you can host the answer on sure. on the website yeah right. or as part of uh, further inputs yeah understood uh all right we have one more question which says uh, various correspondent banks also ask for certified and self attested copies of kyc documents of key persons of banks how safe is it right. to provide such documents <laughs> data privacy is, is is a big challenge globally but uh, i would say that when the large uh, institutions who are providing correspondent banking services mm -hmm. uh, they are well aware of the sensitivities around data privacy secondly this information is being called for as part of uh, completing their legal obligations as to who are the people they are dealing with it's it's no different from from a bank asking for the client identification documentation of its end consumer or end customer Hmm. so so any respondent bank has to see that it's a customer for a correspondent bank and correspondent bank is asking the normal set of documentation and i doubt very much whether any of the large international institution who are providing correspondent banking services would be lax about maintaining the data privacy and confidentiality of documents given to them right yes yes data leakage uh, uh, is is a risk we all know but it's uh, if it happens it happens usually with a criminal intent and not as part of a uh, standard operating procedures right so i would right. say that just just how serious a respondent bank is about collecting the information on its customer in a similar manner the correspondent bank is equally sensitive to protecting the data that's been provided to it right okay all right uh you know the next question is uh, how often should cdd be done on correspondent banks is is there any uh this would primarily be uh, driven from uh, what are the policies that a particular bank has about identifying the nature of transaction or or whether a customer is rated high risk or a low risk so, so depending on how the relationship has been a risk created but it would always it's always safe to presume that we conduct at least an annual review and and, and transaction monitoring uh, would always be providing you sufficient inputs whether we you need to do a greater amount of uh, cdd exercise it's not going to change materially and my right. experience of having having worked in different banks shows that even as a branch uh, of a foreign bank operating in india i was required to provide my annual update on the cdd questionnaire to the correspondent banking branch that we used to deal with right so an annual exercise is is a, is a good uh, good enough uh, uh, starting point sure all right 
Okay, we have a question about the one MDB scandal. Um, <laughs> what, what lessons can we learn from that scandal? Now you put me in a tight spot there. <laughs> I think uh, M1 MDB scandal is a classic case of uh, not recognizing the PEP risk associated with the funds movement. Some of the data that's uh, available in public domain, and I was reading an article only yesterday on Wall Street Journal. It even said that third party payments were made, even though it was supposed to move from one government entity to another government entity. It was routed through a private account of an individual. The bank had asked the question and yet decided to move the funds through the private account, which ultimately ended up as a bribery alleged to be a bribery payment. So if we know the kind of customers that you're dealing with and one MDB was supposedly a sovereign fund, one should be extremely careful as to where the funds are going and what's the purpose behind it. Yeah. Sure. All right, so let me take one. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead, Sharon. I thought you were done. No, 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 I'm done, I'm done. All right, okay, cool. So uh, let's take one last uh, question. Uh, uh, so, Charan, uh, what do you think are the kind of liabilities that can fall uh, on correspondent banks uh, if the right measures are not taken? Well, I think we are all aware of the, the risks of uh, money laundering and sanction bursting, and there have been plenty and more cases around it. Right. Uh, so, yes, uh, those financial penalties can be quite crippling. Mm -hmm. They can be quite constraining in terms of what kind of business can you do or not do or right. uh, putting putting commitments to the banks to enhance their systems over a period of time which will include both uh, investing into technology investing into human resources and then having a periodic review by the regulators and that we are all aware of but one of the emerging threads that i see uh, shirish is the risk of class action suit now i don't know whether uh, uh, some of the friends on the net have had a chance to to track the developments but post 9 11 a couple of banks through whom the terrorists had moved the funds into us for mm -hmm. procuring uh, you know arsenal for attacking world trade center those banks were accused of being conduit for terrorist financing and a right. class action class action suit was filed in the united states while to begin with uh, this case was not upheld, but that's a very, very potent risk. And given the number of conflicts that are growing globally in different parts of the world, right. uh, that's that's a real risk that some bank can actually be accused guilty of having facilitated uh, the terrorists and that the victim should be compensated. Right. And that's that's going to be besides what the AML sanctions or the KYC related penalties that regulators would impose. Mm -hmm. And God forbid, if a case like this gets decided in the US, the amounts can be almost crippling to an institution. So maybe it, it, it's an extreme view that one is taking, but it's an emerging scenario for potential risk that we have. And then bankers, uh, both those who are sourcing correspondent banking business, friends who are into the, the risk and control functions who monitor these kind of transactions, they should be sensitive and aware of this risk. Right. All right. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Charan, uh, for being uh, on the call on the webinar today. And uh, I think we will wrap up now. But before I wrap up, just a couple of announcements to the webinar uh, participants. Uh, we will be uploading the uh, PDF copy of the presentation uh, on the ABA website. Uh, all participants will get an email notification from the ABA uh, informing them that it's done and how to download. Uh, also, uh, we will have an online test available uh, after, uh, uh, after the PDF has been put up. Uh, and all those who attempt the test will also get a participation certificate uh, uh, a co-branded certificate from Fintelec and ABA for taking part in this webinar. The deadline to answer the test is one week. So 
uh, please look for the email that you get from ABA uh, with a link to the PDF and the uh, online test. Um, let me also take this opportunity to thank our partners, uh, Asian Bankers Association, uh, for uh, putting this uh, webinar together, uh, especially Megan Amado. And uh, we hope that you will uh, take part in the next webinar, which happens on the 8th of May, and ABA will keep you posted on that. With that, uh, let me wrap this up. Uh, thanks a lot to all of you for attending, and uh, have, have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Shirish, uh, for such a wonderful occasion. Thanks, Sharon. Bye-bye. Yes.